Ladies, gentlemen, and disappointments, we are coming to you live from the Woman Caves in New York and Connecticut. My name is Leslie. And my name is Melissa. And we are Verbally Disastrous. Hello, everyone. This is your host, Leslie M. Jasper of the Verbally Disastrous Podcast that can be found on over 20 podcast platforms, including YouTube. Now, this is part B and the latter half of my discussion on surviving the 2008 recession as a construction worker. If for some reason you missed part A, head back in to the podcast platform of your choice and check out the first half of the discussion. For more information, head over to my website at www.constructiontales.com. If you're here for part B, allow me to introduce you to the second half of the discussion. Let's go check it out. For this particular project, I was bending by hand between half inch trade size up to one inch trade size. Despite the pain, I was still preferring to work solo. I was in agony each and every time I had to make any form of a conduit bend. And yes, you've probably figured out by listening to me up until this point, I am one stubborn woman and I'm okay because it got me to where I am today. I left the sewage treatment project when it wrapped up and moved to a deck job for a different contractor. Now the good thing was that there was plenty of overtime. The bad part was the parking lot was a mile away from the project. Now there was a shuttle, but usually the shuttle was loaded with people and it was taking its sweet ass time to get between the parking lot to the building. So I'm a very impatient person, so I oftentimes walked and I walked on the bad foot. About after roughly a year, I managed to develop scar tissue over the top of the previously torn ligaments. I knew that I needed surgery to remove the scar tissue. The difficulty was trying to figure out the right timing to sit out for surgery. I opted to go for surgery as soon as I learned that my many months of overtime were being shut down. I was affectionately known on the job as the overtime whore, especially especially in my younger years. I had zero idea that this was the beginning of the 2008 recession with even more unemployment to come. I had surgery right before Christmas back in December of 2008. I had to be a regular client for my physical therapy sessions. I remember those first few sessions to be painful as hell. Uh, Once I got past the painful initial sessions, I worked on going into beast mode to get all around better. Now they give you a half round ball to stand on. It works your core, but it also hurts like hell because it feels so unstable on a foot that just got operated on. It was very painful. I'll never forget that. I wanted to curse out the physical therapist. I tried my best to follow the doctor's orders and stick it out as long as he suggested. By April of 2009, I had gotten a layoff from the electrical contractor in the mail. This sneak attack on my employment is known in the field as a letter bomb. These are not well received by people. Should just let us come back for a week and then do it. I understand. As a person who works in the office nowadays, I understand. Once I saw six months of unemployment within this recession, I started thinking about my career and my potential opportunities or lack thereof. I realized that by this point in my career, I only know how to be an electrician for the past 14 years, not including my military experience. The concept of being only an electrician made me feel like a rat in a maze with a very limited means of exiting. I imagined that I would need a college education in order to stand out from my peers. I then considered my mental inventory of my college credits up until that point. Prior to even getting into the union, I was enrolled in a private business college 
and working on an associate degree in business. I had about six months worth of college under my belt before joining the union. Then, approximately a year into my college degree and six months into my electrical apprenticeship, my husband died on his motorcycle on his way home after work. I have shared more in detail about my journey as a widow in my first book of the hashtag Construction Tales series. Despite being thrust into a period of time where I had to work multiple jobs, I refused to quit my college degree. I powered through my juggling act and graduated with my associate degree by 1998. There was a point in my apprenticeship where I had three jobs, full-time college, and my apprenticeship. Two days a week, it was Monday, Wednesday for my apprenticeship, and Tuesday, Thursday for my college my schedule was packed. I did attempt to go for my bachelor's degree in forensics back in 2003. However, the choice to have my son Johnny while juggling, working outside in the cold weather on my railroad projects made continuing college damn near impossible. I had many, many moments of sleeping laced with drooling on my desk while attending night college. A few times, I woke myself up when I heard myself actually snoring in class. Based upon my college history and my goal of working in the office, it made sense to go back into the business degree and finish what I started over 10 years ago. I do not recall as to exactly how I opted to choose my business college back when I went for my associate degree. I took my eldest son, Tom, with me to my college orientation for my bachelor's degree. At the time, Tom was about 15 years old. While we were in the college orientation class, my son pointed out a woman in the classroom. He said she had a very unique look (laughs) that was a cross between a nerd and a biker chick, meaning she had some edge to her appearing to be very smart. My son goes on to predict that he believed that the new classmate and I are going to be great, long-lasting friends. He was telling me that I have the same qualities with my personality as she appeared to also possess. The funny thing about that prediction is that it became so true. Not only did I make the great connection with Francis, but she made a great connection with my bestie and podcast co-host Melissa as well. On occasion, we all get together to do activities such as camping or exploring new locations, all together as a group. Once I found out that Francis <laughs> drove a Jeep Wrangler, I knew my son was spot on with his prediction. The key advantage of this private business college was that it was a small enough of a college to where I got to know several of my classmates well since we shared many classes together. I'm glad to say that Francis is a good girlfriend to me. Still to this day, I treasure that we get together with mutual friends and spend a weekend here and there together when we all have the time. We both went to Iona College to earn our master's in business administration, also known as an MBA, as soon as we graduated with our bachelor's degree. I graduated within the same month as my eldest son, who graduated high school back in 2013. The plus side of not working was that I was able to absolutely focus and kick ass with my college courses. I was thrilled that I was able to maintain a 4.0 GPA for my bachelor's degree. I wasn't exposed to really cold temperatures during the day, then subjected to a warm classroom at night. For anyone who doesn't know, there is a huge challenge when you work out in freezing temperatures for eight or more hours and then try to come sit in a warm classroom. For the average person, it's super difficult to sit in a warm classroom and actually stay awake. I was very forgiving and tried to be as engaging as possible when I taught college courses to union electrician apprentices for Empire College. I earned my OSHA authorized training credentials during the recession period so that I may issue OSHA 10 and 30 cards, and I still have it today. I enjoyed teaching and serving as a mentor for students. I plan to teach more when I retire since sitting idle is not an option for me. Now, as the college classes progressed over the next few years, it made even more and more sense to properly utilize my downtime with college. I had written out my vision of a graduation speech and submitted it to the speech committee who was considering the right speech that they wanted to represent the class. Somehow, 
I missed the notification that there would be tryouts for the graduation speech. I was in the middle of an exam and one of my classmates walked by the class. She happened to work for the college and was also a night student and a friend. She saw me and yelled out to me that the graduation speech tryouts were in progress upstairs and they were looking for me. I was in a panic since I was juggling an exam and totally unprepared for the speech tryouts. My professor gave me the green light to continue the exam when I returned. I ran upstairs out of breath and in a panic that I was possibly missing out on this rare opportunity to shine. <laughs> I came to the classroom where the graduation speech judging panel was sitting. I apologized for being late to the audition and explained that I was sitting for an exam and totally unprepared. I was handed a copy of my own speech <laughs> and told to step out into the hallway and give myself a moment to compose myself. I gave myself some time to catch my breath and compose myself in order to deliver the speech. I shut down my fears and stepped back inside and worked to deliver my graduation speech with great confidence, power, and inspiration. To my utter surprise, laced with sheer satisfaction, I was chosen as the valedictorian for my 2011 graduating class. To this day, I have absolutely no idea how I pulled that off at the last minute. I opted to make my graduating speech about my peers. During my speech, I worked to describe my fellow hardworking classmates who joined me on this journey. I had some amazing, amazing peers. Shout out to James Chickory. Obviously, Francis Avery, my buddy, Shauna Hope. Shout out to Maritza Pelize and my buddy that worked at Sears. I see his face. Charles. I don't remember his last name. I had a few more, but those were like my key people that I was in class after class and we all got together. I would say, despite having to be in class at night, I did enjoy that experience because the, my classmates also contributed to it and made it worthwhile. So shout out to all of you and much success on your careers and life ahead of you. As the lack of work during the 2008 recession continued, my sleep schedule shifted dramatically. I was accustomed to getting up between 4 a.m. and 5 a.m. for work and getting to bed between 9 p.m. to midnight during the work week. I spent a lot of time worrying way more than I should have been doing about the sky is falling and the extreme fear of running out of resources. I greatly feared not being able to put food on the table and keep a roof over my family's head. My biggest fear was being on the streets with my children, being forced to forage food out of dumpsters. This fear lingered over my head tremendously. I would be up all night and until the early morning hours working on my college papers until 3 a.m. to 4 a.m. In hindsight, I'm grateful that I had college homework to keep my mind mostly busy during the recession. I probably would have stressed myself out a whole hell of a lot more if I was sitting with idle hands. In construction, it's very much feast or famine. You have to have a decent amount of savings to help you ride out those blocks of time that have no available work. When it is feast time, you have to be willing to work ridiculous amounts of overtime. Ever since becoming a brand new journeywoman by 2001, I would go for any and all overtime that was offered. Over the years, I used to watch many journeymen walk out the door and enjoy their summer. I felt a tinge of jealousy of their laziness while I was powering through heat and humidity in order to work the overtime. When the overtime dried up on the job, all you heard at the break table were guys who didn't work the overtime bitching and moaning about how they should have worked it. The old timers on the job would always say, save your money, kid, <laughs> to the young people on the job. I knew of plenty of guys who lived well below their means in an effort to have a cushion to hold them down during a recession. Not enough people heed that advice. I'm grateful to God that no matter how bad it became, I never had to file bankruptcy and never ran out of food for the table or lost my home. 
I know quite a few guys who lost houses, toys, and cars due to the recession. There were quite a few guys who got divorced and had to go back home to live in the basement. Over the years while I was attending college, employment was limited to only a few months on projects. Once I got, say, a six-month hit of work, I would then sit out another six months before getting called onto another project. I would get another four to six months of work on the next project. I would then sit out another few months. It was frustrating since I could not get on a project that had any legs. I was experiencing this spotty employment all the way up until I left the tools in 2014. I even ran into situations because of the accumulative unemployment where I ran out of my unemployment benefits. These moments put absolute fear and sheer panic into my heart. How the hell am I going to continue on and support my family with such limited work on projects? I wasn't even getting called to a project since very few were available for myself, much less other union members. For the year of 2009, I literally worked for three weeks. I got back to work and found out that there was limited available work on the job. This on and off employment went on all the way until the end of 2011. I got on this new job and I was told that it was only a two week call. I was so frustrated when I heard the news on the temporary call. To make matters even worse, I was concerned about my son who sustained a football injury and needed knee surgery. I was super concerned about running out of medical insurance and having to pay for the surgery out of pocket. Despite the stacked odds, I decided to work as hard as possible just in case there was a remote chance to stay for any other upcoming projects. It was my luck that the project was located in a dirty spot. The journeyman slash working foreman that I was working with really didn't like to get dirty at all. I joked with him to sit back and let me get my hands dirty. <laughs> he liked that I took charge, knocked out some holes in a panel for some nipples, and handled business so that he could stay clean. My plan to take charge and showcase that I was capable of working hard worked. He asked me about how I learned to work a particular style. I then name dropped the journeyman that I worked with when I was an apprentice. The person that I name dropped happened to be a good friend of his too. I moved on to a few mini projects with the same guy and we knocked them out. I then got an opportunity to work with some guys within the shop. The blessing was I worked with them just as seamlessly. It didn't take long to realize that these upcoming projects had some legs to them after all. I was honored when I was one of the lone female amongst a team of other guys at a local New York Racino. We worked for about six months on moving slot machines around to different setups. Funny story was there was the head guy of what they call the money train in the casino. So when they close the casino, there's different cars on wheels and there's a group of guys that are wearing these like coveralls. They're on camera and everything. So they have to go to each one of the machines and pull the money out of the machines and put them in these locked boxes that are on wheels. So if they run through the casino as soon as it, it closes up. So it's like very guarded. They have armed guards and everything, right? So we're working amongst them. So the guy came up to us and asked us, where are we from? So we told him that we were local three electricians. And the guy goes, no way, you guys are a union? He goes, you guys are working like savages. He goes, I thought you were some fucking rednecks from upstate. He goes, the way you guys came in here and manhandled these slot machines like gangbusters. He goes, I would have never guessed that you guys were union electricians. He looks over at me and he's like, and you, you're working like a fucking animal like the rest of these savages. It was an honor to hear that, that compliment. He was like, you guys are amazing and, and you're doing great work. So it was cool to hear that from another person say on the outside so we worked for about six months on moving the slot machines around into different setups at the very beginning of the project we didn't have hydraulic machines to drop the slot machines onto the ground and relocate them to the new spot thankfully we got them after a few days into the project each slot machine weighs at least 300 pounds we had between eight to ten thousand worth of slot machines to either take off the floor relocate or bring the new machines off the truck and into the new layout 
Once we installed the slot machines, we had to relocate power as well as the communication CAT6 cable that controls the machine electronically. I was grateful for the work and the required overtime that we came in super early while the Racino was closed. The part where I struggled <laughs> was on my nights when I was in college earning my MBA. I was getting up between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. during the week to get on site between 4 a.m. to 5 p.m. to start work. We had a window between 4 a.m. and 9 a.m. to move some slot machines around while the Rusino was not occupied. I absolutely adored the hell out of the general foreman on that project. He is a no-nonsense person who is rather direct with his approach, yet very fair. I remembered when he joked for the first time. I can't believe that Leslie is the smartest person in my crew. Some may take it as a backhanded compliment. However, I took it as a sincere compliment that was said sarcastically to get a laugh and convey a message. Whenever he came onto the project late or left early, I was his acting foreman. I know his choice made some other dudes jealous <laughs> of my relationship with him. Once the slot machine relocation work was completed, we slid right into the new addition work. If I recall, the new addition that was added required another thousand new slot machines and a couple new restaurants. I have yet to come back to the Rosino and patronize the restaurants. I've always thought of doing it, but never ended up following through. I need to reconsider it before they rip them out and create a different restaurant. I got the pleasure of working in the two communication closets that involved punching down all the new cameras that were required for the addition and the parking lot. I also got to install the closet equipment solo as well and worked with the vendor for testing and installing the special equipment. I was honored to be entrusted with that work. The funny thing was a foreman had said to the general foreman, now this happened right in front of me, it's not to the side, <laughs> it's right in front of me, I'm used to this, this is how we handle business on the job. He believed that this work was something that I was incapable of handling as a solo act. <laughs> I was very pleased to have him eat his words later on. He did apologize to me for talking shit about his conception on my abilities as a journeywoman. By this point in my career, I was accustomed to proving my haters wrong. I had one co-worker who used to come in my closet and mess with me. He used to say that he was looking for me to make a mistake with my punch downs. I then responded that I would now work extra hard to ensure that no mistakes were made in my closet. The funny thing is, my son has worked as his apprentice most recently, and his nickname on the job is Father Time. Very funny. I didn't even get to share with you in a short story the different fun characters that I worked with while on this project. That will be a future short story and a podcast for you to look forward to in the near future. Once the edition project wrapped up, I believe the Rusino lost funding for some other projects within the Racino. By this point, I was working for the contractor for over two and a half years. Right around when some Racino projects dried up, I got an opportunity from my union business managers to work in the office for a very large electrical contractor in New York City. At the time, the office was the largest electrical contractor in New York City. I was super grateful, excited, and nervous for this opportunity. I also had to make an extremely tough decision. Despite spending years and money getting a college education, I was absolutely terrified of leaving the tools. There was the fear of the unknown and the stress of having to learn very quickly how to learn things such as AutoCAD and then get thrown into the fire with my first project in the office. Despite my intense fear of the unknown, I gathered the courage and made the leap. The choice became even tougher when the contractor that I was working for didn't want me to leave. They had some work coming up, but it was a few months away. I would have had to essentially hide for a few months. In the eyes of the union hall, that is not something that they would like for you to do. You're supposed to take your layoff and go back to the union and wait for the next project, however long that that was going to be. To make matters even worse, 
The wait for work was two and a half years. I knew that if I hid and waited for the next round of work, I could possibly lose my new office opportunity if anyone found out about the choice. I felt like I was metaphorically cutting off my own arm. It was a really hard choice where I had to do some soul searching. Ultimately, I cut my own arm off (laughs) and left the tools on March 7th, 2014. In hindsight, I made the right choice. It felt overwhelming and confusing at the same time. I'm glad that I made the right choice since my employment with my first office lasted almost five years. Now that is how I survived the 2008 recession. Stay tuned for more stories that come from my over 25 year career in counting as a journeywoman electrician turned project manager. This wraps up this episode. I thank you for coming on this journey with me as I shared what it was like to experience a very big loss of employment during the recession. But I've been able to turn it around and things are a whole lot better. I thank you for stopping by. You are appreciated wherever you are on the globe. I wish you a great day and peace out Cub Scout. This wraps up another episode on the Verbally Disastrous podcast that can be found on Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. For more information, head over to www.constructiontales.com. Thank you for listening and have a great one.